Today we're going to discuss a bit about what happens when you face a situation where you you think you are being discriminated against in the workplace. It's an unfortunate uh, event that it happens all too often, and it's important for everyone to understand that there are legal protections that you have inside of New York State and within federal law to protect you in these circumstances. However, there's a lot of confusion about what exactly is discrimination, so we're going to cover a couple of different avenues of that today. Um, so today we'll be discussing what exactly is discrimination. You know, the, the term is thrown around a lot, but I think a lot of people kind of just throw it around when they are upset about something, but they might not necessarily know what it legally means. Um, and we'll discuss what isn't considered discrimination and what we won't actually be able to pursue certain complaints about. We'll also be discussing protected classes, which are the type, the categories that people identify with and are inherent to people that are protected by the law itself. We'll talk about how you're able to recognize if you're being discriminated against and what might safeguards your employer, your employee, employers might already have, including some of them by your employers or whether you have to go the legal route. We'll give you kind of a, a heads up, uh, an idea of what to do if you think you're being discriminated against and what you should, how you should proceed. And then we're gonna give you a brief overview of some of the legal processes that you have if you do feel you're being discriminated against. So first, what is discrimination? Discrimination occurs when you're being treated differently than others and the way you were being, you're being treated creates a negative impact on you. In order to be discrimination, the treatment has to be because of your protected status in a protected class. Th what that means is basically if you are, you know, for example, a woman and you're being tr treated differently than your, your male colleagues, that would be considered an, an act of discrimination. The discrimination could be a specific adverse action, such as not having an opportunity for a raise or a promotion or getting a negative performance evaluation, or it could be persistent harassment, comments made, um, specific things stated to you and the way you're being treated. Discrimination can occur in the form of harassment. It could be from your managers, it could be from your coworkers, or it could be from others in the workplace, such as uh, you know, customers if you're working in that type of environment. Har harassment in New York State does not require a, unlike federal law in New York State, harassment does not require there to be an ongoing severe and pervasive instances of harassment. A single incident, instance of harassment can be considered illegal. However, there is a difference when you're being harassed by your managers or by your coworkers. In cases where you're being harassed by your managers, your employer would automatically be liable for that harassment and you would have a case there. However, if you're harassed by your coworkers, the, your employer would only be liable, liable for that harassment if they are aware of the harassment and did not take steps to intervene and prevent the harassment from your coworkers. In addition, another common form of discrimination is when all, all employees are, are entitled to request reasonable accommodations based on their medical needs, based on you know, specific parts of their religion that forbids them from doing certain things. And your employer is required to go through a reasonable accommodation process in which they discuss with you what your, your reasonable accommodation request is and attempt to accommodate you so that you're able to continue working for them. If the employer denies your request for a reasonable accommodation without a valid basis or fails to even engage in the reasonable accommodation process, that could be a claim of discrimination. Additionally, there is a difference between sexual harassment and sex-based harassment, both of which are discrimination, but sex-based harassment would be discrimination being treated differently because of your sex. Sexual harassment is also a form of discrimination, and that occurs when there are unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, or other verbal or physical harassment of a sexual nature. Sexual harassment, in addition to being uh, prohibited by New York State human rights law, 
is also prohibited by Title IX of the Civil Rights Act and other local laws. Due to recent legislation in New York State, all employers are required to adopt a sexual harassment prevention policy in order to have a code in place for how they will react if there is sexual harassment in the workplace. While there are many types of discrimination, there are also a lot of uh, issues that people face in the workplace that are, is not considered discrimination. One thing to be aware of is that while you might have a boss that is a jerk, rude, treats everyone horribly, that would not be considered discrimination. Unfortunately, while it is a difficulty to deal with, if your boss is an equal opportunity jerk to everybody, that would not be a issue of discrimination because there it would be difficult to prove that the reason you're being treated that way is because of your protected status. It's, while it's not required for you to be able to point out directly say, hey, I have a coworker who is, you know, uh, I'm, uh, you know, if you had a, if you were a black employee and you could say, hey, I have a white employee who's being treated better than I am. While that's helpful and not necessarily required, it is important to be able to show that the reason you are being treated the way you are is a result of your protected status. If you're unable to and you can't and you can only say that you're being treated poorly, but you can't actually establish that it's because of your, your protected status, you wouldn't actually be able to prove discrimination. Further, going back to the reasonable accommodation requests, if your employer can prove that it would be an undue hardship for them to grant the reasonable accommodation, then it would not be discrimination. What that means is that Let's say, for, for instance, let's say you were a bus driver and your reasonable accommodation request said that like, you can no longer drive. It would not be, it would be an undue hardship for the, your employer to say, okay, this person can have a reasonable accommodation of never having to drive anymore because that would be the main function of your position. So if your reasonable accommodation request would, would is requiring you to do something that makes it difficult for the employer to continue to function, they do have the opportunity, they are able to deny reasonable accommodation requests in those instances. Finally, one instance that comes up a lot, especially in today's world, political beliefs are not one of the protected classes of uh, discrimination under law. So if, if you're able to connect the discrimination to another protected basis, you could still move forward, but both political beliefs are not one of those classes. The classes that are protected under New York State human rights law are age, citizenship or immigration status, creed, which means a set of moral or ethical beliefs and practices associated with those beliefs. It's similar to religion, but it doesn't necessarily need to be connected to a organized religious group. Then there's disability, which takes the form of both physical and mental disability domestic violence victim status, gender identity or expression, familial status, marital status, military status, national origin, genetic characteristics, pregnancy, prior arrest or conviction, race and color, sex, sexual orientation, and then retaliation for having opposed, for opposing unlawful discriminatory practices. It is illegal for them to retaliate against you both for complaining about discrimination, for helping uh, a coworker who is complaining about discrimination, like let's say your coworker was discriminated against and you gave a statement in support of that, they can't retaliate against you for that, and they can't retaliate against you for making discrimination claim. One thing to be aware of as well is that you cannot combine some of these classes. Uh, in one instance, I saw an, a, a woman who was a single mother who attempted to bring a single mother claim because she was a single parent and felt that was the reason she was being discriminated against. And while familial status and marital status were two separate classes, the court in that instance found that you cannot combine two classes to create a new class. So that is something to be aware of that uh, it's very difficult to go beyond the protected classes that are uh, 
laid out in the law. When you feel you're being discriminated against, there are a couple different ways you're able to tell that you're being discriminated against. If you feel that your manager is treating you differently from another coworker who's not in your protected classes, that is one of the easiest ways to figure out. If you feel that you know you you and the other your coworker are in different classes, but you're doing pretty much the same exact thing, but you're being disciplined for it while your coworker is allowed to get away with it, or your coworker gets a raise and you don't, and there's no difference that you could explain other than your classes, that is a good sign that you're being discriminated against. There's also instances where your manager might make direct comments, you know, make maybe a racist comment or a slur. Uh, in, our, in our legal world, we, you know, we don't actually see that in a majority of cases. Usually it's more inferences that we are attempting to prove. You usually don't get direct uh, racist comments made or discriminatory comments, but that is another sign. Pay, of course, is a sign of potential discriminatory basis. Also, you should figure out if the terms, conditions, and privileges of your employment are being affected. If, for example, if you're not being allowed to telework while most employees are, or if you feel like you're not given assignments that you're supposed to be getting because that's part of your position, or even being provided opportunities for promotion, these are the types of adverse actions that could be considered as part of discrimination. Additionally, of course, being getting a discipline is a major part of being uh, discriminated against. If you're, that could be counseling, a reprimand, or even a suspension or termination. Even if you are fired from an employer, you are still able to bring a discrimination claim against them. And for reasonable accommodation requests, you, if your employer does not attempt to work with your needs and just simply denies the request or delays the request without uh, justification in order to prevent you from being able to get the, the accommodation that you need, these are potential issues of discrimination. And then finally, if after you either file your own claim of discrimination or help another employee do so, if you start to be treated differently, those might be signs of retaliation. There are a couple different safeguards in the law for dealing with discrimination. First, in New York State, there's the New York State Human Rights Law, which is part is Executive Law Article 15. These laws could be enforced by either the New York State Division of Human Rights, the New York State Department of Labor, or a few other New York State agencies that Alan will discuss later on. As for federal law, which also applies to employ employers and employees within New York State, there's the Age Discrimination Employment Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, Equal Pay Act, and Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. The federal agency that can help uh, protect against discrimination in New York would be the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which we will discuss the process for working with them later on. And finally, in many instances, your employer themselves might have some protections. If you signed a contract with your employer, there may often be terms in that contract that discuss anti-discrimination and anti-harassment. If you're a member of a union, there's usually either a union contract or the union itself will interfere with issues of discrimination. There might also be an employee handbook or code of conduct that lays out the guidelines for what is considered discrimination and violations of that policy within your own workplace, or they might lay out specific uh, guidelines for what to do if you're discriminated against and who you can complain against. And in many cases, you, the human resources department within your at your employer can help you decide how to be, go uh, file a complaint if that is an option. If you think you're being discriminated against, there are a couple things you should do. First, you, you should do your best to document what is occurring. The issue is, of course, that a lot of discrimination happens verbally. Um, it, it's hard to necessarily prove. If possible, 
you should communicate through writing so that you have a written record of the of the discrimination and what is occurring in case you do move forward with the complaint. And you should save emails if possible because there's the instance where if you're terminated, you're no longer, you know, provided access to your email. So it's always important to save those emails and to document everything you can. You should also determine how you're going to report the potential discrimination. As I stated before, sometimes people have human resources departments where they will receive complaints of discrimination and they will in investigate internally first. Sometimes you might need to go outside the employer by going to either the union or consulting with an attorney or going to file a complaint with the state. It's always important to know what your, your potential avenues are because you don't want to be in a situation where you don't know what to do when something happens to you. Finally, it's important to be aware of the timeline. In New York State, you have one year to report an act of discrimination. It's best to be to do this as soon as possible. You don't want to wait till near the end and risk an issue with a statute of limitations. But it's important to know that's one year or it's three years for sexual harassment, and it starts at the time that you learn of the of the discrimination. So for instance, if you don't receive a job promotion and you don't find out until you know two months later that the reason is because it was given to an employee of a different class and you realize that discrimination played a part, it's when you learn or should have known that the discrimination occurred that the statute of limitation and the one year requirement to report begins. Now, Alan is going to talk to you about some of the legal processes that you can go through once you decide to move forward with a discrimination complaint. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Sorry for the technical issues in the beginning, but uh, thanks, Danny, for that overview. Uh, I'm going to talk about how to actually enforce your rights under the New York State law uh, related to discrimination. So, as Danny mentioned, uh, there is the New York State Division on Human Rights or of Human Rights. It's a state agency, New York State agency. It's an executive department agency uh, where they have a commissioner that's appointed by the governor. Uh, the Division of Human Rights was created back in 1968. It was named something differently, uh, but it is predominantly the state agency in New York that has authority and jurisdiction over discrimination. And it's not just dis discrimination and employment, which is the focus of today's webinar, but also with regard to housing and with regard to education, all covered under the law. Uh, to file with the Division of Human Rights, as Danny mentioned, there are deadlines. Uh, there's one deadline, which is a one-year deadline for most protected categories. Uh, there is an extended three-year deadline for sexual harassment complaints. But to initiate that process, uh, you can file it electronically, actually, at the division's website at dhr.ny.gov. Uh, you can retain counsel for that process. You can do it on your own. Uh, it's essentially a form that needs to be completed, setting forth basic information, your name, your address, uh, your employer, uh, where these acts occur, the size of the employer, uh, and then essentially what happened that you're filing the complaint about. Uh, these complaints, uh, they can be notarized and verified in uh, the presence of a notary, or they could be signed under oath. Uh, but you would want to be as comprehensive as possible uh, with regard to these complaints uh, because of the process. Uh, once the complaint is filed, uh, the employer will become aware at some point. We just don't know when. Uh, there's really no way to know when. But in our experience, uh, the division is pretty quick. And so, in our experience, usually someone from the division will acknowledge the complaint within a few weeks. Uh, if it takes longer than that, then certainly you could reach out to make sure that the complaint was uh, properly submitted and is being processed. Uh, when it is acknowledged, that is usually when the employer becomes aware of the allegations. From there, the employer will be required to respond uh, to those allegations, which is why you want your complaint to be as detailed and as thorough as possible to give really not just the division an opportunity to investigate the complaint, but also to give the employer an opportunity to respond to that complaint in detail. Uh, documents can be provided if there are documents to provide. 
uh, either in support of your complaint or if the employer uh, puts in their response, they'll certainly have documents. Uh, one of the big ones typically is a handbook setting forth uh, their own anti-discrimination policies, uh, and there might be some other documents that they're using uh, to, to plan their position. Uh, from there, there is an opportunity usually for you as the employee to respond to the employer or something that's called a rebuttal, basically saying that what they've submitted, uh, their arguments on the facts, their arguments on the law is not correct or not accurate, uh, and here's why, and you would hopefully provide some evidence to show why. And then from there, it really comes down to the investigator. Uh, the investigator can do something called a two-party fact-finding conference. Sometimes they could do a one-party fact-finding conference, uh, but essentially what that means is uh, after everything was submitted, your complaint was submitted, the employer responded, maybe you submitted a rebuttal on top of that. Uh, if the investigator wants to do a fact-finding conference, there's still some questions that the investigator has. Even after reviewing all the documents that have been submitted, there's additional questions. So it comes down to the investigator and how they want to handle this. Uh, they can't have a conference. They'll have something called like an interview process. Sometimes it'll be you as the employee. Uh, the people that you named in your complaint may be named to participate in this conference. Uh, everyone's on the phone together uh, and the investigators just asking questions, uh, trying to get more clarification as to what happened, what the allegations are and why. Um, and then usually after that conference is completed, uh, both parties will have the right to essentially submit one more filing, which is a summary statement, uh, essentially summarizing what this complaint is about, what was discussed during uh, the two-party or one-party conference, really to prepare and create a very thorough investigation and clear record for the division to then make a decision. Usually these investigations can take about 180 days. It's not really uh, a fast and hard rule. It, it really comes down to the backlog of the particular office that the division is investigating uh, or the particular area where the division is located. Down in New York City, you know, it's very, very uh, backlogged. And so those cases are taking much longer. Uh, here out in Albany, it doesn't take as long. Um, you know, some of our cases have been from complaint to uh, a probable cause determination, which I'll discuss in a moment, can take a few months. Um, but it really does depend on you know, which office is looking into the complaint. Uh, but at the end of the investigation, uh, there will be something called a probable cause determination. Uh, a probable cause determination is essentially uh, that it's more likely than not that there is discrimination, that there's at least enough evidence to move the case forward to a public hearing process. If the division finds probable cause, uh, they will say they find probable cause and they'll provide reasons as to why they believe there is probable cause. Uh, from there, the case gets referred to a public hearing process where an administrative law judge will be assigned to essentially have a trial process. Uh, one of the detriments of that process is that it does not matter what was done at the investigation stage. Uh, essentially, the administrative law judge will take a look at everything brand new. Uh, yes, there'll be records that were created at the division process for investigation, and you have access and a right to access those records, but an ALJ uh, will make their own decision, ultimately, whether or not there's discrimination, and if so, uh, what are the damages and what are the liabilities? So some of the damages, some of the liabilities consists of back pay, if there's back pay uh, attributed, for example, if you were terminated, demoted, um, something related to your pay was impacted and it was related to a discriminatory reason. The administrative law judge has the authority to issue an award with regard to that. There's also pain and suffering damages, uh, which again, you would have to prove as the employee as to how you suffered and why uh, the employer is responsible for that suffering. So you can testify, you can have people testify on your behalf, medical providers and so forth. But the judge will ultimately be the decider if it gets to that process. Um, if there is no probable cause determination, 
uh, then you do not go to a public hearing process. Instead, you'll have the right to file something called an Article 78 special proceeding, which is essentially is an appeal, but not really an appeal. Uh, but it is a petition uh, that's filed in New York State Court at the trial level, essentially saying that the division's no probable cause finding was arbitrary and capricious or lacks substantial evidence. Uh, it is a close record, and that's why I kind of call it like an appeal, uh, because appeals are usually based on the record. So there's no real further discovery uh, that's provided on an Article 78 petition. Essentially, it's done on the papers, uh, and the trial judge will decide whether or not that petition would be granted. Another opportunity is if there is no probable cause, uh, if you file with the New York State Division of Human Rights and you allege discrimination under a protected category that is also protected under federal law, for example, there's Title VII and Civil Rights Act that protects against discrimination on the basis of race, national origin, gender, uh, those types of categories. Uh, New York state law also protects uh, against discrimination on those bases. So if you file with the division where the same protections are covered under both state and federal law, uh, it does get cross filed with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So uh, what, mean, what that means is if you do not receive a probable cause determination or a no probable cause determination, you can ask the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to review the division's determination. Uh, so the EEOC will take a look at it separately under federal law purposes. And then if uh, they decide there's a reasonable cause of discrimination, um, it's essentially like a probable cause determination, uh, they will try to do something called a conciliation process or give you a notice of right to file in federal court. So there's a lot of different options with regard to how you want to start uh, these complaints and what those complaints entail. Alternatively, you can just file with the EEOC first instead of the Division of Human Rights. Uh, the deadlines are different with the EEOC. Uh, as we noted, uh, filing with the division, there is a one-year statute of filing uh, with everything but sexual harassment discrimination. With the EEOC, uh, there's really two deadlines. Uh, one is a 180-day deadline uh, if, if it's an allegation that is not covered under state law, so a federal law violation that's not covered under state law, or a 300-day 300 de 300 deadline where uh, the state agency, like the division, does have jurisdiction uh, with regard to uh, what you're alleging. So with regard to both of these deadlines, they're both shorter deadlines uh, than filing with the division. Uh, EEOC is even more backlogged unfortunately, uh, compared to the division. Uh, all of their offices in New York are severely backlogged. Uh, I have cases in Buffalo, for example, uh, that have been pending for years uh, in investigation. Uh, down in New York City, it's even worse. Uh, so sometimes, you know, you may want to consider how long this process may take as to where you want to file. Uh, but essentially what would happen is you would file a charge of discrimination it's also a form, uh, it's a form five that's on the EEOC's website at eeoc.gov. That will have to be a notarized complaint. So the division doesn't require a notarized complaint anymore, but the EEOC does. Uh, you wanna be as detailed as possible, just like you would be in your division complaint. And then once that charge is filed, you wait. You wait for an investigator, hopefully to reach out to you at some point to do an investigation. The process is very similar to the division where the employer has an opportunity to respond to the charge, you may have an opportunity to file a rebuttal to that charge or to their response to your charge. And there might be a conference with the investigator. Uh, there might be a conciliation process or a mediation where the investigator wants the parties to try to resolve it. Um, but regardless, at the end of that process, there's gonna be really one of two things. Uh, a letter of determination uh, which would state uh, whether or not there's reasonable cause of discrimination. The EEOC uses the term reasonable cause, uh, where the division uses the term probable cause. They're essentially the same thing. Uh, there's a belief that discrimination has occurred um, in the workplace and really giving the parties an opportunity to move the case into a conciliation process to try to resolve it. If the EEOC does find reasonable cause, 
and conciliation is unsuccessful or the employer does not want to engage in conciliation, uh, then the EEOC will issue something called a notice to sue letter. Uh, that will then give you the right to file in federal court within 90 days. Um, so the process would essentially restart in federal court. Uh, the reason why people use the EEOC is because most of the federal law protections are required to be exhausted through the EEOC. Title VII, for example, requires that the employee needs to go through the EEOC before they can file in federal court. Uh, and other statutes have similar requirements. Um, so if you wanna preserve a race discrimination claim, a national origin claim, a religion discrimination claim, those types of bases, sex uh, based discrimination under federal law, you have to exhaust that through an administrative process before you can take it to federal court under federal law. The EEOC, if they find reasonable cause, there's a very small chance they can decide to litigate the case on behalf of the employee. Uh, I say small chance uh, because the EEOC uh, tends to litigate cases where basically they want or they see systemic problems in the workplace um, that really is um, beyond the one employee, that there are significant issues that are happening with um, various employees or a good segment of employees, uh, sometimes disparate impact claims where a particular category is being discriminated against. Uh, those are the types of cases the EEOC is more interested in litigating. Uh, but if they find reasonable cause with regard to one employee, it's very unlikely that they'll represent that employee in federal court. So you certainly have the right to file on your own or retain counsel to do so on your behalf. Uh, to go through that process. Let me see where are we next. So that's district court. So again, you can get to district court under uh, a couple different ways. And when we talk about district court, we're talking about federal district court. Uh, one way is through the EEOC, you know, exhausting your remedies uh, through the EEOC under laws that require exhaustion and then getting a notice to sue, and then having 90 days to file in federal court. Another way to get to federal court is by going through the Division of Human Rights, uh, getting a no probable cause determination, having it referred to the EEOC to review, and then getting a notice to sue, and then filing in federal court. Another way to get to federal court is under 42 U.S.C. Section 1981, uh, which is essentially protects uh, individuals' equal rights under the law uh, with regard to race discrimination. Um, some attorneys use 1981 uh, because it provides for a greater statute of limitation deadline. Uh, I believe it's a three year period to file the section 1981 claim. Some people use 1981 as well because they haven't exhausted uh, their, their claim at the EEOC and it may be untimely to do so because again, these deadlines they sound like they're long deadlines, but they're actually not. You know, 180 days or 300 days can go by very quickly. Uh, but Section 1981 is a way. Uh, the Federal Equal uh, Pay Act is another way. Uh, the Federal Age Discrimination and Employment Act is another way to essentially bypass uh, the EEOC uh, if you want to get to federal court. Uh, but the federal court will take a look if it's timely and everything's been exhausted or if it doesn't need to be exhausted, uh, federal court will assume jurisdiction over the federal court claims, but they can also assume supplemental jurisdiction over the state law claims if you have a state law violation. So the differences between both state and federal law you know, state law has the human rights law. It's codified at New York Executive Law, Article 15, or Section 296 uh, has Article 15 protections uh, for employment. Uh, you have one year to file with the Division of Human Rights with most claims of discrimination, or three years to file with regard to sexual harassment. And that three year period was uh, based on a, an amendment to the law that occurred uh, a couple of years ago. And there are current uh, attempts to extend deadlines out for all claims of discrimination to three years. But for now, most of them are one year deadlines. 
Uh, and you can make the complaints to several agencies. We did focus on the Division of Human Rights, but there are other agencies in New York State where you could file these complaints. For example, the New York State Department of Labor, uh, the Offi Office of Employee Relations, which used to be GOER, uh, and down in the city, there's the New York City Commission on Human Rights that also has authority to hear these cases if you work in New York City. You can bypass all of that uh, and you can file directly in state court if you're alleging only a state law violation, uh, whether it's uh, Article 15 of the Human Rights Law or other components uh, that may protect you in the workplace. Federal law is different, uh, although there's overlap, right, uh, with regard to the Human Rights Law and the bases that it covers. Uh, federal laws, there are several. There's Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, there's the Equal Pay Act. There's the Americans with Disabilities Act. There's the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. There's uh, the Genetic Information and Non-Discrimination Act as well. Uh, so there's a lot of different federal laws that apply where New York State law essentially is all covered in the one statute. Uh, the deadlines are very different as well. Um, for EEOC purposes, you would file either in 180 days or 300 days uh, if also covered under state law. You would file it with the EEOC, uh, which is a federal agency and not a state agency. And then you basically have to wait and then you receive a notice to sue letter and you can file in federal court or you could bypass uh, the EEOC altogether if you're alleging a violation under 1981 and some of the other statutes uh, that don't require exhaustion. And that is an overview of this process. Uh, I believe we have some questions that were previously submitted that we're happy to answer. And certainly if there's any additional questions, uh, Taylor can help uh, provide it to us. If there are any additional questions, please submit them in the chat and I will send them over to our two presenters. So I am bringing up the questions that we got previously. And someone mentioned the Article 78 process, um, and I touched on that a little bit. Uh, the Article 78 process only applies really in two circumstances. Uh, the first circumstance is obviously you need to file your complaint. Uh, and that complaint would have to be filed with the Division of Human Rights. Uh, the Division of Human Rights, if they find no probable cause of discrimination, you then have that right to file an Article 78. When well, Article 78 is, it's actually part of the New York State uh, CPLR. It's a special proceeding, and then it's a way to get to New York State Supreme Court at the trial level. Uh, you have a very short deadline to do that. Uh, it's only 60 days to file an Article 78 proceeding uh, if you're going to do that, but it also is a hard process uh, because it's essentially looking at the division's determination. They're not really looking too much into what the employer did, uh, but that the division's decision to find no probable cause was arbitrary and capricious or lacking substantial evidence. Another way to get to an Article 78 process is if you did get a probable cause determination and you went through the entire hearing uh, with the administrative law judge and you lost, well, then you have the right to also do an Article 78 proceeding at that point. Uh, but under the law, uh, the Article 78 process after a public hearing takes you to the appellate division instead. So you would not go to trial court. You would probably file in trial court, uh, but it would get transferred to the appellate division where you would have a panel of five judges deciding uh, whether uh, the division's decision uh, was lacking substantial evidence. So those are the two ways to uh, use Article 78. Um, but again, as we previously indicated, if you don't file with the division, then you don't have to file with the division, at least under state law. You could just file directly in court, not use Article 78, just a complaint, 
uh, for a violation under the human rights law uh, within three years of the statute of limitations. Uh, another question I saw that from the pre-submitted questions was what protections are there out there for job seekers over 60 years of age? The New York State Human Rights Law does not just uh, extend to current employees. It also extends to prospective employees. So it, it is a violation for an employer to deny or refuse to hire an applicant because of their age. So you would also be able to go through the same processes as we discussed here. Um, generally, when we talk about age discrimination, it is for employees or prospective employees over the age of 40. However, uh, someone who is over a certain age can still be discriminated against if, you know, even if you, uh, let's say you're in your 60s and they hire someone who's in their 40s, you would still be considered in a protected class different from that person because of the difference in your age compared to the actual person hired for the position. So yes, for the same way, in the same way that you'd be able to bring a claim if you were an employee, you're also able to bring a claim if you were a prospective uh, employee who was denied a position. Uh, there was a general question uh, with regard to uh, how does a judge determine or decide a case uh, if a case is to be dismissed with or without prejudice. Uh, I think it's important to understand what with or without prejudice means and, uh, you know, why a court would do that. Uh, when a case is dismissed with prejudice, uh, that means your case is over. Uh, your only option from there is to appeal that decision uh, to an appellate court. If this is in federal court and you're in New York State, uh, the, the appellate court um, in federal court would be the second circuit court of appeals. So if a case says, or the judge makes the decision that the case is dismissed with prejudice, uh, it's done and your only option is to appeal and to try to hopefully get that reversed and remanded. Uh, if a decision says that the complaint was dismissed without prejudice, uh, there could be a lot of different reasons as to why that happens. But really what that means is the case can be refiled. Uh, so. There's a lot of different reasons. It could be, you know, for I'll give an example. Um, there could be, you know, a discovery issue. Um, so, you know, the judge may want to stay some of the deadlines and dismiss the complaint without prejudice. Uh, one probably common occurrence is when there's a pending EEOC charge, um, a separate EEOC charge, and you're in federal court and you're trying to exhaust that EEOC charge, so you could bring that also to federal court. So if you have a pending federal court case, the judge may dismiss your complaint without prejudice to allow that other charge to catch up for you to amend your case. Um, but if something is dismissed without prejudice, just remember that means it can be refiled. Uh, there's usually deadlines to refile, and those deadlines are usually specified by the judge uh, in the judge's decision. Uh, but if it is dismissed with prejudice, that means the case is done at that point, and your only option is to appeal. And are original timelines of the complaint affected if the case is dismissed without prejudice by the court? No, uh, they shouldn't be. Uh, if you timely filed your complaint in court, uh, then if it's dismissed without prejudice and you refiled, uh, it's preserved. Uh, basically, you will be fine, uh, assuming when you initially file your complaints, everything was timely. All right, I think that's that's all I see here. Okay, thank you uh, so much, everybody, for coming. Uh, our contact information is on the screen in case you want to reach out for any of any other further questions. Um, and thank you again, all so much.
Thanks, everybody.